Welcome to the Suspicions exhibition that's at the gallery at the Loft 112 in Calgary. We're going to be having the talk with uh, uh, Michael Fisher. But before I do that, I'm Barbara Bickle and I'm going to read the curator statement and I'm going to end with a poem that Michael wrote as part of his artist statement. So I'm going to read that now. For Michael Fisher's art creations are spontaneously composed of abrupt shifts, turns, and somersaults that emerge in the solitude of the artist's studio. Although an exceedingly small space physically in studio, the sanctuary holds the vastness of his continually shifting focal point. Each artworking begins with a spark of mysterious intelligence that leaps into the irrational time space of the tricks of the water spaces. The time of the matrix, forgotten, remembered, forgotten. The space of merciful mourning allows transmutations, intuitive knowing, unknowing, suspicions, move translations into form as he communicates the self and the unknown other. A drop. Splash, rub, brush of paint, sharp pointed head of colored pencil, exacto knife, colored map pins, fingers press, pull, drag, then lift from the conscious flesh of wood, paper, canvas. His suspicions are led in the aesthetic ritual by, in, and to a thinking art an artistic intelligence that arises as a gift, a move of magnitude from one's own center to the multiverse, encircling the singular, reshaping and reshaping again the focal point of light. So it's a curator statement and here is Michael's poem. Suspicions, cataract tilting towards the bluff, Elongated bone wings bolted to make the flight tough. I feel like a red tailed hawk, aesthetic releasing from sacred contemplations, erasing privileged marks, piercing precisions, blurred impressions, making what ought to not be easy to the eye. I feel like a red tailed hawk talking, incessant patterns, warping canvas blooms. The watcher careens and swoops to notice. Suspicions of egoic persuasion. A, impressiveness. B, quaintness. C, entertainment. Finishing evaluations, references, and timelessness. I ought to have accomplished something to believe in beyond any of my suspicions, A, B, C. And with that, we give you our Michael Fisher. And that was one thing I had yesterday was that somebody was looking at a piece on the gallery and I was here, a friend of mine, and he said, I'm looking at this piece. And he says, all of a sudden I started seeing things in it. You know, the idea of looking in clouds, for example, or some designer pattern and all of a sudden you start to see something more. And then he says, as soon as I start to see something looking a little fainty, he said, then it starts to disrupt itself and I, and I can't see it again. And it starts changing. And when I heard that, I went, yes, that's exactly kind of what a lot of my pieces uh, were trying to do and are trying to do. And part of that is just, I guess, my interest as a educator, someone interested in consciousness interested in the unconscious and the conscious is the I'm always interested in the awakening the surprise the the um, mystery that happens that you think you know what it is you think you see what it is supposed to be you think you may even see what the artist is trying to do and then all of a sudden that starts to unwind as the more you spend time with it so somebody also said in the gallery the other day they said whoa my gal your work you know it's so diverse You'll get a sample of that today. It's so diverse, your style. Where is your style? Well, my style is all over the place. Um, and I like it that way because I, I tend to just operate with where I sort of subtly feel I want to go. And a lot of times I don't know where I'm going. So a lot of spontaneity. But again, 
a lot of disciplines. So those are two words that are going to come together today. Spontaneous discipline. I'm going to start with just a couple stories about where I developed this aesthetic intelligence, I suppose you could call it, um, really the foundations of my artist self. So the quick three stories are my very earliest non-traumatic memory that I can have is sitting in a garden four years old or so, um, naked with just, you know, the plastic diaper on, sitting in a small garden, which is actually just up on the hill, not too far from where we are today. And I'm sitting there in the sun and I remember playing in the dirt, my feet playing in the dirt, my hands playing in the dirt. And it's amazing image that I actually have. It's almost like I was, I was out of my body looking down at myself in that garden. So that, that's the that earliest memory I have in general. And it's a very positive one. And, and you can see it's, it's right in the tactility of nature and that relationship with nature. And that's important because we lived from that garden only about 20, maybe 20 yards away, walk across the alley, and so I'm gonna to go to when I was about six years old, five years old, um, walked across the alley right behind our house and then we're right on the escarpment of the Bow River, the old escarpment of the Bow River, which is quite high off from the, you know, the, where the river plain is. And so we lived right on that edge and that was grassland, you cannot build houses on there. And to this very day, I, I walk there uh, on my walks and that grassland is still there because it's just too short too steep and unstable slope. Thank you very much. Uh, there are some parts of the city that cannot be developed. And that escarpment for me was my playground. It was most of the time that's where I went. I had the freedom, even as a very young person, to just walk across that alley and go. And, and as soon as you drop over the escarpment, this fascinating thing happens, right? You're no longer visible and under surveillance of parents and all the people who are your neighbors. So I love that invisibility of dropping uh, below the escarpment. And then, of course, I love the vision of what I saw. So the next memory I have in that time period was collecting grasshoppers, catching them uh, in the grassland, and then bringing them back in a jar, and then starting to really look at them closely. Nobody's telling me how to do this. Nobody showed me how to do this. This is all just my own curiosity, just me being into the details and the particularities and under on each grasshopper I noticed their back legs many times had different colors. There was blue, there was green, there was yellow, orangey brown. I can remember them to this day. And so I actually, of course, back then, Mr. Scientist, I was already, you know, taking, extracting a, a leg from the poor grasshoppers and sorting them out and putting them, you know, on the sidewalk in order of the different colors of their back legs. And so this classifier part of me, and that was science was my first career, even art was only there in my life as it kind of came later. Um, that was probably because my brother, three years older, was a great drawer. He was a natural drawer, I wasn't. And so I had to work at it. Okay, so three stories of uh, really part of my aesthetic development, the way I spend time in particularity, and also the universal scope. So just go to the moment, I'll repeat that. The escarpment gave me always that sense of full landscape. I had a total view of the Bow River Valley, which extended east-west, I could see and south, uh, three directions, just really nicely. So that gave me that quality I call universal, or the universalizing aspect to my aesthetic perception and sensibility. And then the particularity was, of course, that going into the very fine tune you know, you know yourself if you're walking in a forest, sometimes it takes a while to just get in to start to really see things, um, to stop and slow down from the pace of the day. But where I grew up as a kid, that, that was always there. So I think um, it made me fit into nature really well and it made me fit into culture very well. So I see myself as a natural base. So three series of art, I'm gonna walk you through examples right now. In this show are, Excess. Barbara is the one that really discovered these pieces because she sort of saw, you know, several of them have this kind of excess where you get into your obsessive mode, you know, kind of like that organizing, categorizing, um, very fine tuned kind of anal quality to the work. And then she said, then you got a nature based, and that those will be quite obvious. 
my influence from nature in some of the pieces. Again, not trying to be nostalgic or trying to be comfortable or even you know, a genre art of nature work. I'm not even interested in that actually. And then the next part of the series is abstract, just straight. And so again, at the end of the talk, uh, feel free to throw any questions at me and draw me out you know, on any of these uh, series or any piece. So let's go to an example uh, of the excess. So this one's a work in progress, still incomplete. As you can see, I'm going, I'll be filling all this in. And yeah, pretty much uh, made of little squares. There actually is a few triangles in there because to make curves, triangles are useful devices when you get into places where the squares don't join perfectly, especially when you curve them. But in general, this was a practice that came about about a year ago as a kind of discovery. And I'll just show you, this is how I work on it, of course. This is totally spontaneous, right? No design. So I am constantly turning the piece as I work on it. Um, just kind of seeing where I think it might want to go or what I want to add next. This influences just the color and where I work. It, it, it's a really fascinating process, which I'll just speak briefly to. Uh, I'll show another couple of quicker examples. But what it, this kind of work does for me, it disappears the self-expression. Now, I'm not going to say there's no self-expression in this piece. That, that would be a bit much. But it takes away my, and you'll see my other ones, I have this great desire you know, to express and explode paint and, and you know, have a, have a two or three hour go, like which, you know, it's just a huge dance and wonderful experience with a lot of my work. Um, but with a piece like this, this is like gonna be over a two week period to finish it. And it's really tedious. But what it does is it's, it reminds me of ritual and ceremony. And that kind of quality in our ancient past you know, is really about pattern and design. That's it's already there. And the square form it is not something I'm making up. I don't. It's not like some creative thing going on. It's like I just take what is already a gift. And this idea, this form, that does occur, I'm more or less perfect. And the beauty of this kind of work is because I'm just going like this, the color pencil grain. Every square is different. And, and I love it because when you're looking at the total, you think, oh, it's a bunch of squares. But then when you start thinking, and if you really spend time with a piece like that, everyone's different. And then uh, just a small completed piece. This one actually started with me coloring these organic forms with the colored pencil crayon. Again, totally spontaneous. I don't know where I'm going. Or along the line of doodling. And then once I sort of had shaded some of that in, I went, hmm, don't really feel like I want to, you know, do the whole piece that way. And then that was when I was just starting to do this square, square technique. And I did color the background with watercolor. That's why you can see some blue underneath or some green and blue. Um, that's just watercolor spread across. And then when you do the squares with the color pencil crayon, mostly black, but I did use a few other colors for the squares. And then I, they just go on top and, and you get this lo lovely sort of texture and, and this dissolving light color combination. And I, I like these people, these pieces because they kind of go like this to me. When I look at them visually, they're, they're resonating at a really high frequency because of just that little tiny white space around every square it has this little white space. And I'm being very careful not to have them overlap. And then very quickly on the last of the excess series, um, a larger piece. And this piece I threw a lot of paint around on the background first. Um, just again, very spontaneously started to see, you know, a few images, but then went in in the finer detail, you can see the square started to happen. And then I started to do a little bit of design work at the bottom of this piece. Um, just these things evolved. I had no idea where it was going to be going. So that just gives you a sense of some of the detail. All right, I think we can move on now to nature-based. So I have a whole wall of nature-based small pieces. And, and because I have a small studio, you can see I prefer really small pieces to work with. 
Just give you a second with that. So I'll go into, these are really subtle meditations for me. They, um, I'm with, you know, this blank piece of white color, watercolor paper, for example. And what I came up with in the last year, I started using what's called brisket or brisket. It's a rubber cement kind of liquid that watercolors use particularly. And you can put down, you know, drip, drip it down or put it on the end of a brush and paint the spots where you don't want any color. So it's a resist medium. And then when it dries this resist medium, you can rub it with your fingers and rub it off. And then you get the nice white pattern where the paint didn't you know, stain the paper. So this is all to me about kind of a staining and resist process. And again, I really don't have too much of an idea what I'm doing. I'm, I'm just going blindly, putting on that brisket, letting it dry. And then I just start to take some color, watercolor washes or whatever, and I start throwing it on. Um, pretty loosely, not really sure. But I had nature-based, I always had this kind of landscape feel, sensibility. Maybe I'm doing something like a landscape, but I'm not really sure how it's going to turn out. And you really don't know how it's going to turn out until you rub all that rubber cement off. And that um, is what I call the surprise. So there's, I was doing a workshop the other day, trying to give people a sense of how I work and how they could perhaps bring into their practice. And I, and I want to share these three sort of core concepts, I guess. Very simply is, I remember I asked them, I says, draw a line. And then I said, once you draw a line, now make that line beautiful. And this was just with colored pencils and paper they were working with. I said, make it beautiful. And that's your own interpretation. Then I said, make it interesting. Now make it interesting. And the last one I said, now make it a surprise. Those are some of the qualities that all of the work that I do. If someone was to come into the gallery and say, okay, so how is he using beauty here? How is he making things interesting? Obviously, creativity is part of it. interesting, I guess, and maybe uniqueness is part of that, but not necessarily. And then the other part is, you know, how is it surprising? Where's the surprise in every piece? And so th that's what I try to do. So here's another one with the same technique as the one I just showed. A little bit bigger piece. And this one was a real mess. I, I was dripping water and all kinds of things, you know, all over it and it was a total mess. Now I do, I do put tape, masking tape around the outside of the paper so that I can actually pull the tape off and have a nice edge when I'm finished. But the whole piece is quite a mess and it's very fast, very intuitive of working. And then rubbing out the masking fluid, you know, I got some really nice effects. And then I did actually take some green wash and cover some of those white effects, leaving some of the white effects not covered. And that I found was a really quite an exciting combination rather than being all the same. And then yeah, so do you see something in here or do you not see something in here? I happened to sit back and I went, oh, I kind of feel like I see a boat in here that's sitting up on the shore. Um, this nice big shape here with these beautiful curves. But you know, I, I couldn't make a boat as interesting as this one. Uh, this one just to me, it, it's it's got the qualities I want of surprise, but enough structure that interests and really intrigues. And, and then, you know, it's got other surprises like the dropping in of this red orange color on top of all these cool colors, right, which I kind of did at the end and I went, okay, this is a risk. I hope this doesn't wreck it. Okay, so I do wreck some pieces and I do let some pieces go. Um, but as I say, mostly I, I, I like to play on the edge and that's to me my escarpment personality. I like to be tipping on the edge of out of control myself and the work and in control. So that's part of the discipline of being in control. And then I think, you know, you could think of all kinds of analogies and dance or music and jazz and spontaneity, um, improvisation. Um, I'm very much a kind of have that personality, that kind of character. I always like to push the edges and, and go over and into those kinds of areas. So I think uh, one more nature-inspired Barbara, do you might get that 
yeah. So this is a different kind of feel to this one. You'll notice it right away um, for sure. So this came off a larger board. I ended up cutting it down. You can see the wood grain kind of cutting through this piece, cracks in the wood. And I kind of quite really like that. And, and it doesn't sort of, those wood cracks and grains, you know, don't normally go with quote, a landscape type painting of mountains. But I think that's what I kind of like that disruption of the, of the nice scene, of the easy scene of, oh, a beautiful mountain scene and people's eyes and want to kind of settle on that. And then if you actually go in and look at this massive blue space here, particularly, which it takes up, you know, a good two thirds of the piece, it, there's actually not a lot there. It, and I don't put hardly any detail at all. I just touched in a few dark and light shades. I was working from a photograph in this instance, but I wasn't really trying to make a photograph. I was varying all kinds of things that were not there. And I wanted just this kind of large body of shape. So here's one that is interesting me. This is the surprise in a way for me, the force of this huge mass moving across this picture. And it's a very small piece, but it has this sense, and you can see I didn't even use a black border on this side. I just took a black border there, painted the black border on the bottom. I wanted to leave it so it feels like it's constantly expanding and going. And yes, just this, again, another little surprise of this little insert, you know, of a, of a piece of mountain that I painted fairly realistically with the light. And I think I just really liked it because it's so different than the typical landscape of comfort and, and perspective that you, you know, we're quite used to in landscape mountain scenes. So this one, fascinating enough, a lot of people really like this one. And, and that was good for me because I wasn't sure. I thought it might be difficult to handle sort of aesthetically for people. Okay, so there's that nature-based. Um, I'm gonna do one of the evocative objects now. Um, I think you've possibly seen the one in white here with this green bird. So evocative object is a psychoanalytic term in technical terms, if you're interested in psychoanalysis, which I am. And psychoanalysis really is looking at, you know, what is it in our historical, autobiographical, even historical, um, kind of psychodynamic, where we are attracted and evoked by you know, basically an attraction to certain kinds of objects. And of course, obviously, quote, the mother's breast, end of quote, is a kind of evocative object in deep in our psychological memory and somatic memory. Well, so I was actually playing in this evocative series of these huge white pieces. I, I did, did these quite a way years ago in 2011. And I was really interested in the pure white as a kind of evocation for me of milk, of mother's milk. And then I said, okay, now if I'm actually going to create in with that evocative space of this milk memory, and again, this is all very subtle. I, I didn't have a really clear sense of that. But then I asked myself, okay, I want to work on that surface and, and really feel the liquidity, you know, because you're painting that liquid with white gesso or with white paint, and, and there's a real wonderful, you know, resonance you have with white liquid and the thickness of it and all that kind of thing. And then I said, well, what would I put as object on that white? I immediately knew the most evocative object I'm kind of aware of most of the time yeah, in my life it are birds. And that goes way, way back into my history. And I was a serious you know, birder um, back in my 20s and late teens into the 20s and 30s. And so birds, and I did a lot of bird painting, so very naturalistic, realistic bird painting. This is not a totally realistic bird painting. In fact, if you go really close, I won't show the detail, but it's, it's actually very subtle. I don't do a lot of detail, just enough here and there to give this realism. And so I won't talk more about that piece other than that is pencil in the background, making that uh, sort of sense of a huge trunk. And then this tiny bird, and I love, again, playing on the edge. Right? There's that, that part of my escarpment personality. I like to be on the edge tipping. And here's this bird sort of tipping and way off the canvas, you know, not 
balanced in an ordinary way. In fact, it's quite on a tension on a slope. And so that creates a scene of both this beautiful calm of the trunk against this contrasting surprise of this green bird that showed up. And in North America, there are a rare number of wild green birds. And this happens to be a female painted bun bunting. So again, not a bird painting, it's an evocative object painting. So if you could bring maybe that Robin piece over. You'll, you'll turn around, okay. Yeah, two pieces I have on the evocative objects. One here is, is a, a gull portrait. And so, but again, I'm just calling an evocative object. I think it's number 515 or something. Abstract or arbitrary <laughs> number. And then this is the other one that goes with it. Um, and this one is, as you can see, sort of these very massive forms of color. And that actually came from that painting I showed you with the mountain scene. This is the other cut half of it. And they had this background, just these huge sort of shapes. I thought I was gonna do something with it. And I had this white streak, which is gonna be some probably some kind of sense of snow or something. But I, I wanted to do an evocative object. So Barbara and I had an experience in Banff National Park. And one day, and I went out in the bush and was kind of sitting down. Um, you know, we're just watching birds, which I like to do. And all of a sudden, I saw this beautiful buried thrush show up in the, in the tree, and the sunlight just hit it. And I have not seen one of these so close as I was that day. And you don't see them often anyway, they're very secretive. And, and then, then when the light hit it, it was this beautiful blue, dark blue contrast with these orange shapes. And the whole body is, is of this. Um, kind of beautiful design. It was just like, this is in the middle of winter and you see this incredibly gorgeous view. So when I came home, I said, I want to do an evocative object, utilizing that evoc evocative experience and an evocative object. And the most part that I focus on from the point of view of the quote object, and you can see is basically the bill. It's a lot of dark <laughs> and, and these massive shapes, and then this very pointed, Bill. And, and to me, I'm interested in, in birds in the shape and the evolutionary history of their bill and how it is such an evocative and very poignant, literally and metaphorically, director along with their eyes and the vision that takes them into the world. And so I really wanted to emphasize that little bit of a shining bill in the light. And, and then I made the decision, which was a really hard decision to leave this snow piece that was on the original background of this painting, to leave it there. And so, uh, yeah, okay, sure, bring that in, Barbara, that would be fun. But they do sort of are from the same painting at some point, I've, I've trimmed them down, that little one, but um, that's where the mountain scene came from. And I said, well, that fits where we saw this bird. We saw, I saw it in the mountains. I had this experience that day of riding my bike in the mountains for hours. So. All of those feelings and memories right from that geographic space and the composition, but coming with this very powerful invasion. And you can see again, I call it invasion. That little strip is kind of like shh. And then this little strip of shh. And then this vertical and cutting across the entire plane. And, and that for me is extremely exciting. Now, whether it's pleasing to people or not, that's not really what I'm trying to do. Um, the, these are not obviously in the sense of trying to be commercial like I used to be when I was a wildlife painter back in the 80s. That, and so to leave that in and cutting across this evocative object that in some sense is sacred, you know, the bird, the beauty of the bird, why would you disrupt it with that? And, and those are the kind of edges of, I think, what makes, you know, creativity and painting. Just like when I go into the abstracts next. Um, you can also start to see, I got this abstract sensibility to the, to the shapes and forms. And again, it's not even a bird painting. Uh, this wall, other than the evocative objects, you know, I've got two abstract pieces here, uh, and then quite a large piece. And I'll just describe the large piece just in general. The point of the abstract for me, I, Somebody asked me in the other day, they said, well, you know, why do you do abstract? Because you have this skill and capability to do quote, realistic art, representational art. And I think 
you know, today with representation and how we represent, whether it's nature or just anything in quote reality, representation is a really interesting philosophical issue. And it's an artistic issue, an aesthetic issue. And it has implications for many things about what it, how are we supposed to represent things, you know, and what makes an artist's way of representation, you know, perhaps a different kind of route than maybe a traditionalist. And so I kind of do see myself as quite a postmodernist thinker. And that's why, you know, when I think of my statement, you know, these Barbara Road, you know, her statement, I'm kind of art and thinking go together, just like art, movement, thinking, feeling, um, start to kind of all go together for me. So I do see myself as quote, holistic, postmodern, in that sense of disrupting normal representation. And I'm much more interested in subtle interrelations. So the big piece uh, was an idea, um, basically I wanted this big space to represent the unconscious. My unconscious, I just said for the moment, knowing that my personal unconscious, collective unconscious are one and the same. Uh, they overlap a lot. And so the whole idea of going into the unconscious was give it space, right? Give the unconscious space in your life. Well, you can do that by recording dreams, remembering your dreams, recording them. That's one way to give the unconscious space in your life. And I do that, I'm a regular dream journaler for decades. But to do it on an art piece, it, I pretty much feel like when I confront a, an empty piece of board or canvas um, paper, it represents in a way the unconscious of possibility. And I'm going to bring a certain kind of consciousness to that surface. And what comes out is if I'm in tune with and in a sense authentic with the unconscious and in conscious interchange, that there will be some kind of authentic relation in the work. It won't be work that, again, is, is nostalgic, settling, um, genre-like, because then, you, you know, I don't think the unconscious is doing much in those kinds of pieces in general. So that's one of my themes. So I won't say too much about that big piece other than I took, you know, each square one by one, I had nine squares. One by one, I would just work on a, on a particular day I did it over a period of two months or so. And I would go into a bit of a meditation. So I know some of you are interested in contemplative arts and aesthetic processes. And that is definitely a lot of what I'll do. I'll stare at an empty surface for a long time. And then at some point I just go, okay, I think I'm in some kind of relationship or attunement. I've brought myself down. And then I put that piece on the floor and I would start to work square and just drop the color of paint, um, whatever would happen. And then I'd start to see images again, just like in clouds, I would start to see maybe something start to form a little bit. But one of the things that's really a, the, the part of the discipline of spontaneity is, you you know, it's, it's, it's easy to take something spontaneous and then, you know, maybe take a part of it and really then start to make it realistic, right? And representation so people recognize something. So I recognize something and feel somewhat psychologically comforted because, whoa, I can recognize something. So sometimes I wanted to just recognize something, bring it out a little bit through drawing with the color pencil, a little extra painting, a little more detail than the big messy part where I start with. And then solving certain kind of aesthetic problems, lighting problems, I still want to make it beautiful and interesting and have a surprise in it. So I'm still sort of using those criteria. I don't think of that consciously when I'm working, but it's always there. And so each piece gets resolved at some point. But as I say, there's a really fun tension between total messiness and chaos and, and just enough order to, okay, that, that's enough order. Yeah, and, and not too much chaos. And, and I guess that's just something I have to figure out where that is and where that sits for me. This wall shows all the black on the background of these five pieces. So I'll say a little bit about working on a white surface or a light surface. But generally it starts white. Um, working on white is a whole different experience, um, obviously for various reasons. Uh, I see myself as putting paint on white 
and the weight is is giving light to those colors. Um, it's reflected light from from the light surface. You know, physically and scientifically, that's what's going on. And so when I'm constantly working and dropping colors, paint, and marks on it, that white light is is in some sense feeding those marks. Um, and 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 I'm working constantly in that reflection of the light coming through, in a sense, the color, the marks, uh, the stain, whatever it's going to be. That's great. Uh, the white surfaces, bright surfaces, really bring out color. I mean, right, we know. It just gives a huge illumination to color. Working on a black surface is very different. And I've been working on black surfaces for a long, long time because I love the difference. I get to be in a whole different mood. When I sit in front of a black piece and I start working on it, it is now like I'm pulling, I'm pulling light out. I'm making light come out of darkness. You know, in the in the beginning, right? As they say, in the origin there was nothing. The no thingness of of the universe, in a sense, of creation, and from nothing comes something. And that's what I'm now doing which is not the case when I'm working on it. I don't get that experience at all. So this is what I would call more a via negativa approach. Um, working from that quote, negativa space, time continuum of the eternal darkness, the nothing, and then start working those bits of color. This is done in color pencil, this piece. And uh, the color pencil, you can't get a really bright color but you can get enough of, of a brightness. And then I'll go in with a little acrylic paint to pull out some of the highlights. And you can see those and then make it sparkle a little bit, give it a little bit of that extra life. But again, this was a piece, I just start moving the color pencil around on black. Um, I don't, I think I started with this brown color here. And yeah, you can just see, the, a little bit of that brown, red, orange. I think I just started with that one color. I didn't know where I was going. Start to make a few shapes, get a little bit of the light and dark, you know, contours happening. And that's all just by, you know, a simple shading technique of going from lots of color pencil, pushing hard and then, then lightly. And I want to emphasize that with the dark pieces that, that, that to move from a, a pressing hard on a crayon to moving off, reminds me very much, and I'm very aware of it, doing it, because it has so much dramatic effect. It's very similar to, to what I, in the Eastern arts, the martial arts, Tai Chi movements, uh, where you have a real intensity pushing down or pushing out, and then you relax and ha, ah, you breathe out. Breathe in and push, breathe out, relax. And so these pieces on working on black, I'm very aware of that relaxation and intensity. And God, it's so much fun. I've been doing this for so long. But each piece, when I do it, it still has that excitement of that intensity. And I think it's because it's a very integrated process of, of movement. It's very holistic in that sense of intensity and release. Intensity and release. And then obviously, in the end, I have to find some result. OK, so uh, I think that wraps up the form part of the talk. So Nice to see you and Barbara and everyone else as well. Um, I'm really, um, uh, that was fantastic. I really enjoyed listening to that. And I just was thinking, oh, I wish my students were here. I wish my daughter was listening to this session because I was just thinking, you know, what was really, really wonderful was to hear um, your process, to thinking through the work and then talking about the work. And I think very often we are missing that when we see pieces of art, we don't, we don't see that, that, that space, I, I would call it the moss space from where it wasn't something to something, you know, that, that, that journey. And I think that was really well done. Um, I wanted to say too, I, I really enjoyed your poem. Um, the opening poem, I really, uh, the, the part that really stuck out to me was the piercing precision. And then I thought that you pulled it in so well with the beak because that is just so perfect. And then ending with the ABC at the end. So just that, the juxtaposition between the natural and, and and then the you know um i guess the precision of i would say research work or and and then again i think that came out when you we, you talked about uh, your early classification 
uh, as a child sorting and, and planning. And I just wanted to think about, um, you know, is, is that is that just a natural thing that we we organize and deconstruct and try to classify? I sometimes thought if that was sort of a, a colonized thing, you know, that we've learned to do. But when you talk about it, you know, as a young child, that's really interesting that that is how we're we're making meaning by separating and then maybe holding on to a small piece and try to make sense. Anyway, the thing that I really wanted to ask you was to show the first piece up close, the peach and burgundy colors that look kind of like um, topography. And you talked about ritual and ceremony on that one. It's a pattern piece and oh, fantastic. You know, this kind of reminds me a little bit about, uh, you know, um, the, the indigenous art um, of dotting. I, it's beautiful. Yeah, I, I love I love the dotting that I've seen in Indigenous art. That so also, that, yeah. I don't know if you remember, but at least in the days when I was a young person in in my teens, um, a lot of people were using black pen point little dots and doing really amazing drawings. There's people that still do that artist, and they put the just the dots together of a, a pen and nib, and you get these beautiful um, pointillism basically approach. Mm -hmm, that's right. Right. That's right. What, what's Thank so you. you know amazing about this, and I, I agree with you that it's got a certain kind of map kind of quality of, I do feel like I'm working on a, a space, right? You're so aware of the full space. I think the reason you're aware of the full space so consciously is of like a landscape or a mindscape is because you can only go so slow. <laughs> You know, when you've got brushes and paint and you're putting lots of energy of expression into that landscape space, of, let's just use that metaphor of the container way or the map that the white paper is. Um, when you're going so slow, you, you have to appreciate each particularizing moment to moment to moment to moment. And that is a whole other kind of art. I do it for that reason. It, it's a good discipline that my more free abstract and loose work does not bring out of me. And so I feel like this really balances and that's where I think I lose myself in that moment to moment intensity. And you have to really pay attention. I mean, the moment I lose my attention, I can tell I, I put one square too close to each other and I've lost the little white line. I just want to, you, you, you so, this, sorry. Uh, where you were, but I just want to point out that when Miguel was doing this moment to moment, his foot was tapping and Miguel also was a drummer. And I'm just thinking about that right. tapping of the, of the drum as well. Yeah. Right. Hmm. Um, for those little squares, are you using a very fine, a very fine pen? So would you like draw an outline? And then color it in, or is it um, well, it's just, it's, the chisel part? Yeah, you no outline. You're not doing any drawing. It's actually a coloring, and that's the distinction I make between a drawing and a coloring. Is um, a coloring just works. You work from the inside, and you just color in a note. And if you end up with a form, well, you've colored the form. If you draw a form and then color it in, very different process. No, no, I'm I'm speaking about the the individual squares so too, yeah. each individual square it's um it's starting from the inside and then you're you're not coloring in the square is that what you're saying the, the, yeah i you just move the pencil grain back and forth you know in this very tiny way and so you definitely, wow. definitely are not making an outline and that's why each one it has a little edge it has a little break it's not perfect when you go close and i love that they're a square but they're all organic. Can you show it again up close? That sounds so yeah. cool. Because I think that's actually harder to imagine instead of like drawing a square and coloring it in. Yeah, that's amazing. Thank you. You bet. Yeah. That's a great. I love attention being given to a piece that I give so much attention to, Pauline. Mm -hmm. 
I'm just just referring to the same um, piece there. I, you know, you were using the word, words like obsessive and that when you okay. were talking about it. And so, um, how does that? How does that? Um, I guess the word or the the quality of obsessiveness relate with that with with that process. I mean, just um, I know what obsessiveness means myself, <laughs> and so I'm just trying to imagine that when when I hear you describe the mm -hmm. um, the process of the the coloring. You know, um, I think the distinction I would make different. Yeah, you're with me. Um, the, 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 the distinction I'd probably make just right off the top is if I was if I was neurotic obsessive about it, it would be very different. Because what I would do, and I know there's artists that do this <laughs> and people, I would take a ruler and I would okay. measure off that paper, you know, at two millimeters by two millimeter squares and I would grid the entire piece and then I would color each of them. And you get, a, you know, the same kind, mm -hmm. little bit of the same effect. Um, but here the difference is because I want that little white space between each new piece, right? I'm leaving this little white edge. So they got a really tiny maw space between them. Um, and that, then I can't use the grid technique very well. The grid technique would spoil it because there'd be that line, that marking line. So I'm, I'm, I'm ridding that and I'm trusting. So here's the difference. I think it, this is a, a trust-based process and it's not perfect. Um, as soon as I go to a place where I don't need to work on my trust because I've marked and measured everything, I, there's no real trust there. You know, the okay. trust, it's kind of almost a mistrust. And I've, I mean, that to me, I think Pauline would be bring more the colonial aspect in. I know I'm talking to Susan now, but I was thinking of Pauline talking about the possibility of colonializing a space or a territory, right? And uh, I think what I, I am very aware of that, I have done those kinds of grids back in my early days, but I think now I love, I love the quality of concentration, attention, and not perfect. Everyone right. yet in, incredibly precise at another level. And I, yeah. and I just, when you speak about the colonialism, I think about the parceling of the land, you know, that was yeah, done to divide done the grids. Canadian, the grids, right. and it paid no Perfect. attention to the environment, right. landscape, and the people that lived mm -hmm. on those lands. Right. It was just this mechanical grading. I think the quality of trust that you're talking about, though, that I think trust is a, is a helpful word here for me in, in thinking about this anyway, but that takes it out of away from the whole obsessive piece yeah yeah and not not wanting to glorify obsession which you know a lot there's some very obsessive quote artists um who you know, make a whole lot of money on those quote obsessions and yeah it gets really glorified in in the art world and yeah i think uh it's there's there's got to be some something more uh, I guess, you know, I, it, I would love people to come and spend time with the actual original piece. And it's, it's being able to go into the imagination. See, when I find the obsessive pieces, that I, when I look at them, even if they're not gridded, you know, with rulers and stuff, you, I can tell that that artist has not given me any room for mistake. It's, they've not given me entry place into the imperfect. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And and that kind of turns me off, even though I may have a visual impression and go, oh wow, that's amazing. You know, that must have took you forever to do. You know, that's really not my interest. What is it about abstraction that that draws you? I used the word creative, right? That freedom. Was, yes, that was what you said. Yes. Of course, it's, it's, it's more subtle than that, but. It is a freedom, freedom to imagine, you know, like beyond representational and beyond any of those forms of what I call comfort, nostalgia, ease of ease of knowing what it is. I, it, it takes me into the mystery of not sure what that is, okay, which is a great confrontation when you come in front of a piece. I find I'm not, not sure what that is. 
you know, you can't easily categorize it. And so in this whole show, I was, I used suspicion as the title. I was suspicious of my own tendency for nostalgic representation and settling and people liking what they see because they know what they're seeing. <laughs> Abstraction gives you the freedom to just stretch beyond that kind of comfort zone. And so there's a certain unease, a creative unease, I would say, when in abstraction that's really enjoyable for me. Thank you. Thanks, what, any, right. another question? I had a question. Um, I also wondered when you were talking about kind of how you work with the piece where you'll kind of sometimes sit in front of a canvas and just let things kind of inform you before you, and then you're also talking about the contrast of the mess and then putting order into the mess. And I was thinking about, I would, cause I, I don't do visual art, but I was thinking about how much that reminds me of my writing process. And I was curious the, if you find parallels with writing or how, cause you do a lot of writing too. Is there any parallels between art and writing and then, or what are the differences? Because I often feel, especially with a new big topic, I'm taking in a ton and it's painful and it's like, you're kind of like, dealing with this mess and then you're slowly going in and crafting, but you want to keep the mess as well. I'm just very, curious. Very similar, very similar. You know, I, I think that's, you know, there's a fancy term for it, but it's also a term for it, it's existential capacity. How much existential capacity do I have to sit with the unknown and the complexity of what's coming here? Right. Without going into anxiety panic, I need to get order on this really quick. So it's that fine line about, yeah, there will be order, but how quick do I get to the order? Mm. How much can I hang out with that unknown and a kind of uncomfortableness? And so I think it's very similar. I would say the poetic experience is very similar to what I do as spontaneous discipline. I think the poets who, who do work probably could relate a lot to what I was saying in a general tendency and approach. I think people who write composition in spontaneous and improvised ways would also relate to what I'm saying. Cool. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. And I particularly like what you just um, said about this existential capacity and that resonates uh, with me and I'll be um, meditating on that, if you will. <laughs> Uh, you know, I think it's a common language, we, without being about art, it's about when we're in life and we want to get to the end of something and we don't want to sort of really hang in to see and be with the process of getting it. So we just want to get it to happen, make it happen. And it, it creates a kind of syndrome of anxiousness and a need, right? A need to, and I'm trying to work with not needing, but just desiring the process. And I, and needing. Yeah, and I would think, to, I, I think too, that it really is a reflection of our society of always wanting to finish or always wanting a sense of completion. I mean, we operate, I, I at least I feel, you know, in the one part of my life where I operate from task to task to task, right? And the satisfaction or the release of tension or anxiety when the task is completed short term. <laughs> short term. Yeah. Which is the opposite which is the opposite of my own artistic practice. So I, I appreciate your um I think you framed it as your split personality. Like I can relate. Thank you. When you were saying that with the, the existential capacity and just that conversation to it, it the word that came up for me was trust that you trust that the process has its own like intelligence and it will complete when it's ready to complete. And I think that that is an existential capacity in a way that you actually trust. You don't have to kind of force it, but it's painful to be in it when you're like, I don't know if this is going to come together. It just feels like a mess, but then you have to actually trust that it will. If you like, no. two, two distinguished things come for me in terms of trust or radical trust, as you call it is one is the trust of what I call a psychic level of trust or a philosophical, psychological mind level of trust that I understand myself psychologically. I understand some kind of ideas about creation and how it works and the universe. The other level of trust is quite different. 
and it's material based. It's, I trust the materials to guide me and be with me. So it's not all just in my head of a trust, you know, it actually comes from trusting and walking through the materials and textures and feeling and seeing where it wants to go. That's a whole other kind of trust I really like because it's not so challenging as this kind of more mental trust. <laughs> it just takes a lot, a little more work. But material trust is just so basic, I'm just with the material. Something like that. Interesting, yeah. With that, thank you all for coming and thank you to Michael for sharing. Yeah, thank Our you. Beautiful. Really appreciate this. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was lovely. lovely.